Good evening, everyone. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. My name's Andrew Roberts. I'm Dean of the College of Physical Mathematical Sciences. It's great to have such a, a, a large crowd here tonight. I want to congratulate uh, Professor Tony Eggleton on the publication of his book. Um, I won't say much more because there's other people who will say more, but congratulations on behalf of the ANU community for, for, for that achievement. Uh, just in terms of a few protocols, um, there will be no questions and answers after the end. We're running on a fairly tight timetable, but of course those wanting to speak with Tony at the end are, are more than welcome. We'll have uh, drinks at the end. Uh, I'd like now to introduce Kim Ar Armitage, who's the Academic Publishing Manager from Cambridge University Press. Thank you, and on behalf of everyone at Cambridge University Press, a very, very warm welcome to the launch of a short introduction to climate change. Climate change is one of the defining issues of the 21st century. The scientific principles and the associated evidence are complex, but the public debate has increasingly veered away into simplistic statements, often dressed in the veneer of science that tend to obscure the real position. The result is that it's difficult for people who are not experts to know quite what to believe. They need a way to navigate the complexity so they can be informed and make up their own minds. Tony Eggleton has answered this need perfectly with a short introduction to climate change. He respects readers by not dumbing down the science and not skipping difficult or unclear aspects. He welcomes readers with an approachable and engaging style. Most of all, he comes at the subject in a balanced, methodical way so different from the politicised accounts that predominate in much popular media. Cambridge University Press is very proud to be the publisher of this important book. It will make a powerful and positive contribution to the understanding of climate change, not just in Australia, but throughout the world. Please join me in congratulating Tony on producing this exceptional book. Our next speaker and the person who will launch this book is Dr John Hewson. Dr Hewson was leader of the Liberal Party of Australia between 1990 and 1994. Since then, he has run his own investment banking business and served on the boards of several businesses and charities, including General Security Australia Insurance Brokers, Osteoporosis Australia and the Arthritis Research Task Force. He was recently appointed as an honorary professorial fellow by ANU and holds a position within the Crawford School of Public Policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr Hewson to launch the book. Thank you very much, Kim, for the very warm uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I saw the name on this book, Tony Eggleton, <laughs> I remembered a particular Tony Eggleton, who was Federal Director of the Liberal Party for many years, and I'm sure would have been a denier, <laughs> as far as climate change is concerned. I uh, think Kevin Rudd was right when he said that uh, this uh, Responding appropriately to the challenge of climate change is the moral imperative of this century. I think it's certainly also uh, probably one of the most significant economic, social and political, if not religious, issues of this century as well. Certainly the first half of this century when the focus of attention is, is really trying to contain the, the uh, extent of global warming. Um, I think that... Um, one of the things that has most disturbed me in recent years has been the way the political constituency for change has evaporated as much as it has. I mean, Kevin Rudd was elected. Uh, he uh, came in with a pretty strong mandate to sign Kyoto and to get on with responding to climate change. And it was, in most of the polls, it was at least 80% of people thought that this was a very significant issue and that, you know, he had, uh, he had the mandate to actually respond. And he set out, and I met him on a couple of occasions through that process in my role as uh, of, um, chairman of the business leaders, National Business Leaders Forum on Sustainable Development. And he assured us that uh, he had a very tight timetable. He was going to have a green, the Ghana report and a green paper and a white paper and the legislation. And if the legislation didn't go through the parliament, he'd double dissolve parliament and drive it through. And that went pretty well until February of 2010. <laughs> 
when his opportunity to have that double dissolution was passed by and uh, ended up costing him his job. But the constituency for change was 80 plus percent when he came in and it's now in most polls about 40 plus percent. And the issue has been handled very badly in, in terms of our political process. I mean, as an economist, I think it's important that we put a price on carbon. And uh, I'm in favour of a very pure market response to that challenge, uh, as free a system of uh, auctioning pollution permits as you can have, uh, with a, an independent authority doing the auctioning and all the proceeds from the sale of those being managed outside of government, fairly, <laughs> fairly um, um, idealistic uh, expectations, I think, of what, what, what should be done. But uh, the whole process politically has been handled so badly in terms of the, the day to day political debate. Uh, the Prime Minister announced that she's going to put a price on carbon back in February and then for the best part of five or six months didn't say anything about it. Didn't try to explain it, didn't do what this book does and this is why I think this book is very important. It's try to take the science and explain it in very simple terms because uh, people are easily scared and Tony Abbott has proved that point very effectively. He's been able to make some enormous and significant claims about the likely consequences of uh, introducing a price on carbon, unanswered really from the other side of politics. And so the constituency that existed for change back before the last election was, was effectively destroyed and I have no doubt if Tony is elected Prime Minister he will abolish the, the carbon tax as it's called and will go backwards. And I find that a very frustrating set of circumstances because uh, you know, this issue is a very significant issue. The challenge is very real. I'm no scientist, but I suspect that we're not going to get 2% global warming. We're going to get more the way the numbers are running. And um, it's a challenge that needs to be dealt with now. It's not a challenge uh, that can be left to the last minute. You can't wait to 2049 and figure that you you make the changes that are required to get there by 2050 so we don't get 2% global warming. It has to be front end loaded. Uh, and uh, the way I look at the numbers, if we are wanting to reduce emissions by 90 or 100% by 2050, then we should be aiming to do something like 25 to 40% by 2020 and not the 5% target that we see embraced by both sides of politics today. And these are, this, uh, to me, the, the challenge is very real the challenge is very substantive and it's very urgent and it's not being acknowledged. Now, you know, how do we know that climate change is an issue? To my mind, very simply, we only know because clients, climate scientists have done what they traditionally don't do. That is, they've actually agreed on something. It's the nature of science, I think, to disagree, to challenge each other's hypotheses, to challenge each other's research conclusions. Yet when you get more than 95% of the peer assessed climate scientists saying that this is a problem, a serious problem that needs to be dealt with urgently, uh, for the rest of us who can't look out the window and see climate change as an issue, I, mean, we, I think we should take them at their word. And I think people like Tony who've taken the trouble to try and explain a lot of that science in a form that can be understood by you know, the average secondary student, uh, school student or, you know, a lay person in the street or somebody like me, I think he's making an enormous contribution. And that's what the Prime Minister and her team, in my view, should have done once they decided, and the Greens, once they decided that they were going to put a price on carbon, they should have started to explain why and to link the science to the problem, the magnitude of the problem and develop a constituency for change. In politics, it's hard to get to build a constituency, but for most changes, in my experience, uh, there was one here and it was squandered. Uh, in launching the book, I just wanted to have one point of hope, though. I mean, you can go around the world and look at how disparate the, the, the debate about climate change is these days and how much the constituency has been eroded in a lot of countries. Um, but I wanted to say briefly something about an exercise I'm involved in, which I think is a very positive way of dealing with the problem. I mentioned that as an economist, I think it's important to put a price on carbon. As an economist, I also expect that in an appropriate response to the challenge of climate change, there will be a whole host of new businesses, green businesses, new business opportunities, something of a technological revolution if it's done properly, where it will generate new businesses and new jobs in sectors that perhaps we can't even imagine today. We can identify some of the alternative technologies, we can identify some of the renewable sources of energy and so on. 
but the pace of technological change in those areas can and should be accelerated if we respond appropriately to climate change. So as an economist, I say to myself, what is it that's going to drive that change? And the answer is investment. Investment is what's going to happen, is, is going to drive it. I've been involved in a series of businesses since the late 1990s, trying to prove the point that you can respond appropriately to climate change as a business person, and you can actually make a quid out of it as well. We did the first household garbage recycling plant at Eastern Creek. Part of that process was to extract the methane gas from the garbage in 24 hours, the combination of aerobic and anaerobic digestion, turn that into power, use the power to run the plant and sell the rest into the grid. An income stream as well as a, a very significant environmental improvement. I built a company that uh, generated, uh, that, that developed energy efficient light bulbs uh, that uh, was significantly helped by the mandation, the banning of incandescent light bulbs by Malcolm Turnbull when he was uh, the relevant minister. Uh, we built the, in another business, we built the largest biodiesel plant in the world in Singapore. Uh, I've been involved with green data centres and presently working on projects in PNG that will convert um, household garbage and sewerage and uh, green waste and so on into electricity and only 12% of the people in that country have power. But my point is there can be a technological revolution. Just when we did the household garbage recycling plant at Eastern Creek in 2000, uh, there are about nine different versions of second and third generation applications of technologies today, and that's what you will get. So how do you drive that process? Most of those businesses suffer because they can't get investment. So the exercise that I'm involved in now is something we call the Asset Owners Disclosure Project. It's under the auspices initially of the Climate Institute here in Australia. It's an Australian initiative, but it's of global significance. We look at the top funds managers in the world, superannuation and pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, endowment funds and trusts and so on, we're looking at the top 1,000 of those funds in the world. Those funds manage more than 60 trillion US dollars worth of funds. They invest more than 55% of those funds in carbon intensive industries. And they only invest about 2% of those funds in low carbon intensive industries. So our strategy is to work on those, those 1,000 funds. They're funds that have managed about $5 billion US or more each. And the idea is to work from the top down and the bottom up. From the top down, we are surveying them, asking them uh, in a survey that's open now how they are responding to climate change. And climate change is a very significant risk to those funds. The risk of a catastrophic weather event is a significant portfolio risk in terms of portfolio theory, to so asking them how they're identifying and managing that risk, and then asking them how they're investing that money, and why in particular they're investing about 55% of that money in carbon intensive industries, and so little in, in low carbon intensive industries. And the aim is if we can get that 2% of funds invested in alternative technologies to about 5 or 6% of those 60 trillion US dollars of funds under their management, then we would create enough investment capital to drive the technological revolution that's an effective response to climate change. So as I said, we're working from the top down by surveying, we're working from the bottom up by launching, as we did recently in New York um, before the storm, a, um, a social uh, media platform where individual members of superannuation and pension funds, beneficiaries and members, uh, helped online to contact the trustees or directors of their pension and superannuation funds and ask them how they're managing climate risk and ask them why they're investing so heavily in carbon intensive industries. So from the top down we're going to embarrass them and from the bottom up. And when, uh, in the end of this in next month, in November, we're going to announce the ranking of the top 1,000 from AAA rated down and I can imagine that they will in many cases be embarrassed into responding and you don't need too much of a social revolution. We call it the vital few. We only need a vital few to start asking the questions from the bottom up. And those directors have a reducery responsibility to answer those questions. So I think there are some positives underway, even though the constituency for change has, has, uh, has evaporated as much as it has. And, and sad to say, as I know in most surveys, it's down around 40% now when it was well above 80 or nearly 90%. 
So in the context of the debate that we still have to have in this country, this book is very important. So I think it does actually fill an important gap and it's important that people with Tony's standing and experience can take the complexities of, of much of the scientific debate and put them in a form, as I said, that can be right, widely read by the average Australian, be they high school student or, or you know, uh, adult interested in the issue. And it's that information that becomes fundamentally important, I think, to over time building a, an appropriate constituency for change. So it's against that background that, I have, that I'm delighted and honoured to be able to formally launch this book and ask Tony to come and speak to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Hewson, for those very encouraging words and for saying all those political things that this particular Tony Eggleton is not game to say. <laughs> and thank you everybody here for joining my launch. First let me tell you why a geologist wanted to write a book about climate change. If you go back in history, as Dr Hewson has just mentioned, all the way to the end of 2009, climate change was either the greatest moral issue of our time, or it was crap. And who are we supposed to believe? Well, many of my non-scientist friends asked for my opinion, but I'm a scientist. And though I did have an opinion, I didn't have the knowledge. And so I wasn't prepared to share that opinion. Instead, I decided to find out in the only way I knew, which was to go to the scientific literature. This was not to get an opinion, of course. It was about acquiring knowledge. And the essence of knowledge is trust. You know chocolate tastes good because you've it tried it. You can trust your own sense of taste. And you know cyanide is a poison, probably not because you've tried it, <laughs> but because someone or some book or some person you trusted told you so. You know the sea is salt because you've probably gone swimming. You may also know that the air is 78% nitrogen. Have any of you measured it? You only know it because you read it somewhere and you trust that source of information. Well, I knew I could get trustworthy information from the scientific literature. Scientific literature is peer-reviewed. Now, you've probably heard it said that peer review is a little closed circle of mates that praise each other's papers, so they all get published <laughs> and they all get more funding and so on. No, that's far from the truth. Responsible editors, first of all, choose reviewers that are not well known to the authors. In most cases, the reviewers are not your mates, they're the competition. They're out there to find your errors, to look for mistakes, any shoddy thinking, and they'll soon find it for you if you've made it. And then, of course, you have to be able to read all that literature. Well, I have a great advantage because I had ready access to the university library. And thank you, ANU, for keeping me on as an emeritus <coughs> professor so I could access the library. You know, you have to pay about $30 to read a scientific paper. That paper will almost certainly have been funded by the taxpayer. But you still have to pay $30 to read it. So I reckon it probably would have cost me at least $30,000 to read all the work that I had to read for the book, but I didn't have to spend any of that because the university provided me with the necessaries. Well, okay, I can trust the literature. Why should you trust me? Well, first of all, Will Steffen. He's the director of the ANU Climate Change Institute and he's on the government's climate commission. He kindly agreed to read the text. I don't think he had the slightest idea who I was, <coughs> but he urged me to publish it, and made many helpful suggestions. So thanks to Will, I, re I revised the text. Then came Barry Fordham. This time he is a friend and a colleague and a geologist. He read the revised chapters as they emerged, helped me make the text clearer, and made many helpful suggestions. So thanks to you, Barry, I revised again. 
Well, next it went off to Cambridge. The most respected publisher of science, they don't publish unless they're absolutely sure that what's in the book is right. So they had three climate scientists review it. None of these guys were my mates. They might have been ladies too, I don't know. They each gave, it, they gave each chapter the treatment, and so that led to a third revision. Well, just as the text was getting to its final edit, Cambridge wanted a couple of shouts. That's nice remarks about the book from people who might know something about it. Well, Will Steffen, who'd already read it, said yes, he'd make a shout. And then I asked Tom Wigley. Now, Tom is the former head of the Hadley Climatic Research Institute at the University of East Anglia. They produced one of the three very carefully documented analyses of global temperatures over the last 120 years. And by coincidence, Tom and I did third year physics at the University of Adelaide together. At least I think we did. We must have been in different lab classes because I never met him. And I can't believe that an Eggleton wouldn't have noticed a Wiggly. <laughs> but despite not knowing each other, Tom very, very generously read it. He read every word and he corrected lots of them. And that, of course, led to a fourth revision. So now the book has had five reviews by climate scientists, none of whom knew me, and to whom I am extremely grateful. So I think the book has been truly peer reviewed and I think you can believe it. One of the more remarkable outcomes of writing the book has been the realization of just how easy it has been for us to change the Earth's climate. Some will tell you that carbon dioxide is trivial of every 10,000 molecules of air, only four are carbon dioxide. What can such a small amount do? Well, first, if it was cyanide gas, we'd all be dead. <laughs> Second, if they weren't there, if those four molecules weren't there, there would be no life on Earth. <clears throat> that minuscule amount of carbon dioxide sustains all life on Earth. Year by year, it feeds the plants, and the plants feed all the animal life. Sometimes not much, four parts per million isn't much, sometimes not much is just enough. And there's more about carbon dioxide. If you want to invent a doomsday weapon, you don't need nuclear bombs, you don't need a Star Wars death ray, all you have to do is suck the carbon dioxide out of the air. You take out the carbon dioxide and the temperature will go down. And when the temperature goes down a bit, some water comes out of the air. Where is the atmosphere most humid? In the tropics, where it's warm. Where is it most dry? At the poles. Antarctica is officially a desert. So you take a little bit of the carbon dioxide out of the air and a bit of water vapor comes out. Now water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. We know that about 60 to 70 percent of the greenhouse effect is due to water vapour. The rest is carbon dioxide and a few other gases. So if you start to remove the water vapour, you start to cool the atmosphere. And if you take out more carbon dioxide, then you'll cool it a bit more and a bit more water vapour will come out. And you keep on doing that. And once you've got rid of all the carbon dioxide, doomsday. It's ice from the poles practically to the equator. Global world temperature about one degree C. And the opposite is true, of course. If you add carbon dioxide, the temperature is going to go up. And if the temperature goes up, the atmosphere can hold more water. And if it can hold more water, it can produce more rain. East coast of the United States knows that right now. <laughs> According to Kevin Trenberth, who's a senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, all weather events are affected by climate change because the environment in which they occur is warmer and moister than it was. We're now heading towards doubling the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the air 250 years ago and the temperature is rising. So very clearly, mankind has the power to change the climate. And a second thing that's hit me and is now beginning to scare me and that has been the speed of change. This is a flood and drought prone country, so 
The recent long drought was not really atypical, but the floods of 2010 and 2011 were. Equally extreme has been the, the last summer in America with drought and searing temperatures, abnormal weather over Europe, and of course the huge melt of the Arctic sea ice this year. For perspective, think about this. At the end of the last ice age, it's not long ago, 15,000 sort of, it was coming out of it. At the end of that time, the great ice sheets of Europe were moving, melting northward at about 50 metres a year. Probably just fast enough to be perceptible to Grandad when he took his young grandson hunting. Since 1978, the edge of the Arctic sea ice has been retreating at 8,000 metres a year. Not 50 metres a year, 8,000 metres a year, 8 kilometres a year. I know you can't attribute any particular weather event to climate change alone, because weather events and variations are greater than the slow change of the climate. But the frequency and the severity of extreme events has startled many sane, balanced climate scientists. It was what they predicted, but it seems to be happening more quickly than they expected. You can see from this why I feel it is so important that the truth about climate science must reach out to the whole community. And most critically, why those who will make the decisions on stopping global warming need to understand the science. Why the engineers, the economists, the social services, the trade unions and the politicians, all our essential non-scientists have to know the science. And why the nonsense preached by those who deny the reality of climate change must be refuted. And that is why I wrote the book. It was written for you. It was written for inquiring non-scientists. It was written for secondary students and their teachers. It was written for our grandchildren. In the hope that our legacy to them of storm and fire might not last. In the hope that they and their children might be able to achieve what we could not. A world where energy has no hidden costs. My thanks to the ANU and to Andrew Roberts, my dean, for supporting the publication of the book in colour with a grant. My thanks also to Kim Armitage and all those at Cambridge for agreeing to publish and for being so easy to work with. It's just been a breeze, the whole thing. <laughs> Glennis, my wife, helped enormously with her positive criticism, encouragement and support. I don't think she expected for better or worse to include three years of a book, but she's been with me all the way. Many thanks to the family, especially Paul, and to my friends who have listened to me and read various parts as they were written, and to Julie and John Dyson, in whose hospitable house many of my ideas were aired and discussed. You have all been wonderful. Thank you. Professor Eggleton, it, it falls to me to give the vote of thanks. Um, it was wonderful to hear a voice, a former voice from the Liberal Party speaking so eloquently about climate change. I, I think we very much miss that voice in the Liberal Party today. So thank you, Dr. Houston, for your words. I, they, they really resonate with, with us as an audience. Many of you, I, I see many colleagues from the ANU community here. Many of you, of course, know Professor Eggleton. Tony, I struggle to use titles, sorry. Um, many of you know Tony for many years, and he's a distinguished mineralogist. Um, a mineralogist is someone who studies minerals, um, surprisingly enough, not climate change. And, and what Tony has done is written a really good book for the non-expert uh, in that area. And I keep a little supply of books on my bookshelf for politicians and chief scientists and people like that. Uh, to help educate them around the things they need to know to do their jobs well, I think. So this will be joining my little pile of books to give to people. It's really a superb effort. It is better in colour, I agree. <laughs> um, 
So, so thank you, Tony, for this book. It's a really wonderful effort. But also to your family who's made the sacrifice of letting you do it in your retirement. Um, I often say what a, how I look forward to retirement, to doing what I want to do instead of what I have to do. T Tony is a good advert for that, but of course the family continues to have to deal with his absence. So thank you to all of you for, for, for your contribution to, to what is a wonderful book. We now have drinks available. Uh, Professor Eggleton is available to, to, to sign the books. Uh, and of course, you're welcome to buy as many as you wish. Um, <laughs> drinks will be served in the foyer behind us. And I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and your drinks. So um, please join us. Uh, thank you again, Tony. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs>